I had the, the economic means to do whatever I wanted to do. I didn't have to act some way to be at a job or anything like that. You know, it, I've been free. Not everybody has that. Now we have this controversy in the United States where they're burning books, you know, that say the word gay. They are afraid that if a child hears about gay, then it'll make them want to be gay. Well, our sons, you know, heard the word gay every day of their life, like 10, 20 times a day, gay this, gay that, and gay dads, and gay, gay, gay. It didn't make them gay. Those pieces, not only because they're marble, but because of where they came from and how they were created, have a soul of their own. You spirit, you like get goosebumps when you see them. This is where they belong, and if somebody wants to see them, come to Greece. Shot through the heart, and you're to blame, down and you give love a bad day. If you think that our life has a soundtrack, this was surely some of the songs that he wrote for Desmond Child, for Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, Kiss, Bonnie Tyler, and many more. He was in Athens to give a big conference in the Rhodio, with the goal of the destruction of the Marmara of the Parthenon. Πάνω να το συναντήσω για να μιλήσουμε για τη μουσική, του διάσημου φίλου του και τι κλεμμένε καριάτιδε. In 1979, at the age of 26, you produced the super hit uh, uh, was made for loving you, for kiss. How did that happen? At that time, I had my group Desmond Child and Rouge. We were on Capitol Records, and we had posters all over New York City. And Paul Stanley of Kiss was walking down the street. This is as he tells it, and he saw this picture of this gorgeous, you know, god of of manhood, surrounded by these three beautiful women. And so he said they look very interesting. So he came to see our show at a place called Trax. And right before the show, he, he peeked in the dressing room and introduced himself. And uh, it was so thrilling that he was there. And then he said, George Harrison of the Beatles is here. He's in the front table. So I took a peek and I was like, oh my god, I almost you know, fainted. And uh, you know, so then af after the show, Paul came backstage. And he said, you know, why don't we try writing a song together? Wow. So I said, okay. And the first song we wrote was I Was Made For Loving You. How confident uh, were you back then about your talent? Well, I was born confident. And so, um, you know, the thing is that I wasn't good enough to be that confident. But I, I, I was ready for the big time always. And uh, it took me really a long time to get good at, at, at writing songs and producing records. But at that time, you know, it was kind of like I had more confidence than I had skill. I was 17, and uh, the very first person that I in introduced my music to was Clive Davis. He was the president of Columbia Records. What did he tell you? Well. It was a kind of funny story because I had a writing partner, Virgil Knight, and so we had our little demo and we snuck into a music business um, convention and we dressed up impersonating John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Which My, one was you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> okay, I was John Lennon, and I had my hair like this and gla glasses, all white suit, and she had the big floppy black hat, hair in her face, big black sunglasses, and we just walked in, and nobody stopped us because they thought we were John and Yoko. So we were, John and Yoko, John and Yoko, we no. were taking pictures. We just <laughs> kept our head down, walked in. We saw two seats empty, and the table next to us was Clive Davis, who is the person we wanted to meet. And we turned and he saw us and he started laughing because <laughs> he thought we were John and Yoko as well. So I had my tape, I said, here's our tape. And so he took the tape and we waited two months. Finally, he sent the tape back. 
and uh, you know, with a letter, very nice letter saying, you know, we're not looking for, you know, talent oh, no. <laughs> like yours, you know, uh, at this time, and one of those kind of letters. I wish I still had the original letter. Did you meet him again? Oh, yes. Yes, we got to work together, you know, because I, I made it. So exactly 40 years after I had given him my demo, and now it's uh, 2012, I, I get an award called the Clive Davis Legend and Songwriting Award, and he gives me the award. So it's like, wow, you know, it takes 40 years to give him a demo and then for him to give me the award. Did you tell him the story? Yes, he loved it. He loved it. For me, you are like Steven Spielberg of the music. I, I mean, like that. every song is different. Yeah, from except another. better looking. <laughs> Much, much better looking. So, what would you say defines your music? I think that they all have a currency of what I call the currency of hope. Because the songs are always leading upwards. And so, that's why I think they've stood the test of time. Songs like Living on a Prayer. I mean, even the music is like, you know, keeps growing and lifting up and up and up. How different is the music industry today? compared to the 80s and the 90s? I don't know about that because so many things have changed, especially technology. Because you could write a song in the morning and press send at night and it goes out to the world. When we were trying to make it, we were putting out our own um, you know, cassettes and you know, doing our posters, putting them up ourselves in the middle of the night in New York City. And our friends that were other performers, we'd exchange mailing, mailing lists. And it's, it's kind of like what pe we, people are doing, what I'm doing now with social media and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. I'm very active with it. I mean, I, I, wrote, I wrote my autobiography called Living on a Prayer, Big Songs, Big Life with David Ritz. And when I started the book about five years ago, I went to see a publisher and, and uh, this very elegant lady, and I said, well, would you like to publish my book? And she said, well, let me see. What are your numbers on social media? I don't know. And it was like, I think it was, I don't know. It was like five years ago. It was like 700 people following me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that woke me up, and I started getting very active little by little by little by little, and we're we're up to 650,000 followers on Instagram. So you're an influencer now? I guess so. Well, I, I would say Instagram is influencing me <laughs> <laughs> because all I do is like, I want more followers. I want a million followers by next year, by for Christmas. Is that too much to ask? You have addiction, you know that. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I thought my sons were like screenagers I, I don't know what you call an old person that's on the screen all the time. You know, so last night we were having dinner, everybody was on their own thing. It's like, a well, this moment. is, yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, sending each other stuff. <laughs> and you were laughing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You are married and you have uh, children with your husband. Yes. In Greece, efforts have been made to allow gay couples to get married. Have you something to say? that could help uh, in this direction? Every country is different. There are countries that more, are more conservative than others. I can't criticize that. You know, look how long it took France. You know, they invented sex. You know, <laughs> they invented... And kiss. <laughs> they invented gay. You know, they invented <laughs> gay Paris. There you go. Um, and it took them a very long time to have gay marriage because it was a uh, very religious country and Catholicism is very much a part of their culture. It took them a very long time. And you can't, everybody has to go at their own pace. I can't criticize that. Is it time now it's for time, Greece? It's time for people who are gay to have the courage to come out, be honest about who they are, take, take the chance, and um, let the, and everyone's gonna say, I knew that. We always knew that. 
we just didn't want to say anything because we didn't want to embarrass you. And now we have this controversy in the United States where they're burning books, you know, that say the word gay. They are afraid that if a child hears about gay, then it'll make them want to be gay. Well, our sons, you know, heard the word gay every day of their life, like 10, 20 times a day, gay this, gay that, and gay dads, and gay, gay, gay. It didn't make them gay. I mean, we tried everything. Uh, Broadway shows, <laughs> uh, matching outfits, <laughs> trips to Paris, um, you know, the opera, the museums. They are jocks. All I can say is, we're very happy, and I'm very happy with my husband. We've been together 33 years, and we got married when our film came out in 2013. So next year will be our 10th anniversary of being legally married, and I could not be happier because I didn't care, you know, what anybody thought, and also I had the the economic means to do whatever I wanted to do. I didn't have to act some way to be at a job or anything like that. You know, it, I've been free. Not everybody has that. When did you first hear about the Parthenon sculptures? Oh, I've, I've, heard, I've heard about it for forever. You know, I mean, you know. Have you seen the marble? The Saturday British Museum, of course, it? yeah. And what was the feeling? Those pieces, not only because they're marble, but because of where they came from and how they were created, have a soul of their own. You spirit, you like get goosebumps when you see them. Yes. And that's why, you know, the hope and, you know, the international cry for them to be in their, in their birthplace, you know, which where is right belong. where they belong, right here. This is where they belong. And if somebody wants to see them, come to Greece.